Is the most expensive knife in your collection the one that gets the most pocket time? How's it going everybody? I'm Roll Shambo, the connoisseur and collector of all things sharp and shiny. And whether you answered that question with a yes or a no, I'm interested, pop it in the comment section down below. What knife do you currently have that's getting the most pocket time? For me, it's been this Tucson TS-296. And here's the thing, I've had it for a couple weeks now, and I've really had an opportunity to carry it a lot. And then that opportunity passed, and I continued to carry it. You see, this is a sub $100 knife, but it looks like a $300 knife. Does it perform like one? Did I just need more time? to figure out my ranking system because guess what this is another episode of grail or garbage the series where i systematically and categorically rank and review these knives so that you have the context that you need to understand if it deserves a spot in your edc rotation does it deserve a spot in your display case today we find out is the tucson ts 296 a grail or is it garbage All right, so it's about time that we get to ranking this Tucson TS-296. Before we get going, I do wanna mention that this knife is available at the time of recording this video, and I'll make sure to link it down below. Uh, it was on White Mountain Knives for $79.99 and on Amazon for a little bit more, not too much. I think it was still at or just under the $100 price range. By the end of the video, I'll let you decide for yourself if it's worth it. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get going talking about the materials. Now, there are two main ingredients that we need to talk about when mentioning the Tucson TS-296. The first is titanium. And trust me when I say that it's not super uncommon to see titanium on a sub $100 knife. However, it is uncommon to see this much titanium on a sub $100 knife. Here's what I mean. The handle scales are contoured and milled. They're all titanium. They're not milled out on the inside. No weight saving on the inside of the handle scales. Uh, the backspacer, and yes, it has a backspacer, which is not a tiny little end cap type deal. It actually does go up and it, so it's going to protect the, the tip of the blade. That's titanium. And then this weird shaped, weird looking pocket clip is also milled titanium. The lock is also titanium. Uh, there's very few bits and bobs on the handle scales that isn't titanium. You know, the exception being your screws which are steel. And then of course the blade, and let's talk about the blade. The blade is 14C28N, a really, really decent stainless steel, which is easy to sharpen, holds an edge for a decently long time, can take a polished edge, and it's tough. It's a really well rounded out mid-range type steel, and you can find it on this knife. So when we're talking about those, you know, what makes it special? Well, at the $79.99 price tag, it's really good. It's really good because you get the premium feel of titanium handle scales, and then you also get a blade steel, which is not just something to look at and then send back to the manufacturer when you can't sharpen it any longer. It's actually usable and it's very user friendly. And so for those reasons, I'm going to be scoring it an eight out of 10 for materials. Next up, we have ergonomics. How does it feel in the hands? Is it comfortable? Are there any hot spots? And is there anything that's sharp that shouldn't be sharp that's really going to dig into your hands? And you know, honestly, this is a very comfortable knife and I'll tell you why. It has the suggestion of where to put your index finger, but I mean, that's where you're going to be putting your index finger on any knife is, you know, right there behind the tang of the blade, right? Well, 
Kind of not really because they didn't really do more than give you a suggestion and I actually like that. You see, Tucson is kind of like that art teacher that you had back in high school. Maybe the substitute teacher that didn't really care how you got the assignment done as long as it was completed on time. And that's kind of what they did here because you can hold this in a variety of grips. Reversed, ice pick grip, comfortable. Regular grip, comfortable. Saber grip, comfortable. Now it does lack jimping up here on the spine of the blade, but I'm not necessarily going to ding it for that because unlike with the Beyond EDC Riverwolf, they didn't give us this massive finger choil that says, choke up on me. Uh, no, instead you have this flipper tab here that actually is just a subtle reminder of, hey, you know, if you push in hard to something, this flipper tab will keep your index finger from running up on the blade. It does have a sharpening choil there, but that is in fact a sharpening choil, so do not try to put your finger there. Although if you needed to, you could slightly trigger pull it, you know, it, for some really fine detail work. I don't necessarily suggest doing that, but <clears throat> you know what? Make up your own mind if that's something that you want to do or not. Other than that, the contouring on these handle skills is nice and while I would normally save this for the design part of the ranking, which comes in at fit and finish, we have to talk about this milling during ergonomics because they didn't just give us flat slabs. No, they gave us contoured and milled out handle scales where part of it is this circular grate cheese grater type you know, texture. And then the other part is smooth and they really could have played it safe like some companies did <coughs> beyond EDC and just giving us, you know, smooth, flat handle scales. A lot of companies do that and people are fine with it, so it's whatever, but in this case, this milling actually does something. It adds grip to the blade, or excuse me, it adds grip to the handle scales, which is awesome, because without that grip there, if your hands get sweaty and you're not, you know what, it could slip out of your hands. That's all I'm saying. And so this extra bit of texturing right here is nice because it adds some positive indexing to the handle skills and you don't have to worry about this flying out of your hand, you know, if it gets wet or if your hands get sweaty or whatever the reason may be. If you're working in an oil factory, you know, producing canola oil all day, you know, maybe don't bring a knife to work. I don't know what I was trying to say there, but essentially this is going to add some nice grip to those handle skills. It's also nicely knocked down around the edges, so it's not really going to cause any discomfort, even if you do give it a decent amount of pressure when you're gripping this, this knife. We also gotta talk about this pocket clip. Now this pocket clip is weirdly shaped and weirdly placed. At first glance, I kinda wish that it had been just centered and then, you know what, move in between the handle scales, but then that would have been really long, so maybe the way that they did it makes sense. And as far as the ergonomics are concerned, it's actually in a really great place because you don't feel this when you hold it. You do not feel that pocket clip. And that's great because it's all the way down here. It's up against the pads of your knuckles. That's, you know what, that's perfect. Good placement, the pocket clip is not a detractor. And you know what, for all of those reasons, it's going to be getting an eight out of 10 for ergonomics. Now, in case you haven't seen my YouTube shorts where I absolutely fidget the crap out of this knife, this knife is very fidget friendly and it's got a lot to do with the balance of the blade and not necessarily the deployment feature. By the way, it only has one deployment feature, that is a flipper tab. So if you don't like that, this is definitely not the knife for you. But Fidget Factor is all about how much you want to play with it, not necessarily about how many options it has for deployment. It also has to do with the pivot as well as the uh, detent. There we go, that's what I was trying to say. The pivot is a single-sided pivot and it's running on bearings. Now I do believe that these are steel bearings and not ceramic bearings, but it could definitely do with a ceramic bearing upgrade. It's not necessary, but with all the aftermarket options out there, ceramic bearings would not be too difficult to put in this guy. And you know, currently if you don't feel like doing that, it flies out with authority and while you do hear it open and close, it's, it's definitely not bad at all. The primary thing for me is the balance on this knife. It is so easy to index and flip 
and you know move between the fingers so if that's your kind of thing and it's definitely becoming mine uh, this is definitely a great knife to fidget with and it's something that i love carrying with me to work because it's just so easy to hold on to i know what the knife's going to do because it's nice and balanced and so i can index it rather well and for all of those reasons it's a great fidget knife and if you haven't seen my shorts on fidgeting with this knife make sure you check it out and you'll see what i mean this knife is very very easy to fidget with i definitely appreciate it the detent is not super crisp but it's also not super light either and part of that has to do with the fact that this is indeed a frame lock so most of the time you're putting at the very least a little bit of pressure on that lock bar it's not too hard to go ahead and deploy regardless so if fidgeting for you is just relegated to deploying the blade that will do just fine. The fidget factor on here is great. With the upgrade of ceramic bearings, it could be fantastic, but I cannot rank it based on something that you may or may not put in it. And so for those reasons, it's going to be getting a very good eight out of 10. The fourth category is the lock. The lock is an extremely important component of any folding knife because it's what guarantees the knife's not going to fold in on you. It's what lays between you and a bloody mess of a trip to the hospital. So yeah, it's pretty dang important. In this case, it is the frame lock. If you've seen one frame lock, you've seen them all. The differentiating factors of a frame lock really come down to a couple different things. What makes up a good frame lock? Well, it has to do with how much lockup do you get between the lock bar and the tang of the blade. In this case, you get a very healthy 30%. That 30% is nice and confident, and it also means that you're not gonna get any blade play up and down, left or right. Um, that being said, even though you might not think that this belongs here, I do wanna talk about the fact that Tucson does not apply any Loctite to their hardware. It's something that they let you do instead of doing it themselves. And while some might be like, yeah, I want to apply my own Loctite. I have Loctite and I don't necessarily always want to apply it. And so here's the thing. If you're always fidgeting with this knife, it will introduce blade play. Now, luckily, after doing a little bit of Loctite to the pivot, it was not an issue and it has not come undone ever since. So that blade play is really only if you fidget with it a lot and you don't apply your own Loctite. If you buy this knife, by the way, make sure you put some Loctite on the pivot. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. And a little bit will go a long ways. But it is something that I definitely recommend. Access to the lock bar is important as well because you want it to be comfortable. You don't want to have to dig for it. And you also want to make sure that you don't miss it. If you're not looking at it, it should be something that is really easy to index and comfortable to index. And in this case, it is. A lot of that has to do with how they chamfered that out and scalloped out that lock bar. That's fantastic. It's not hard and it's definitely not uncomfortable. So, you know, good on them for that. It also has a over travel stop as well as a steel lock bar insert. And I know, I know I've done a video on knives uh, that do not have those and it's kind of debatable. Some people think that you need it. Some people think that you don't. And here's the thing on this one, given that there's no blade play, blade play I actually like the idea of a steel lock bar interface because that hardened steel on the tang of the blade is not going to be wearing down the hardened steel on the steel lock bar interface. It could be debatable whether or not that's actually going to happen over the lifetime of use with a knife, but if you're fidgeting with it a lot, like I tend to do, it is just more of an opportunity for that to happen. So in this case, because it's not affecting the lockup at all, I don't see a reason not to have a steel lock bar interface, and they did not disappoint. Something that is kind of cool is that the uh, steel lock bar interface screw is the same size as the pivot and the pocket clip, which is T8. So good on them for that. While that's good, at the end of the day, it is still just a frame lock. And you know what? Because there was no Loctite on that pivot and actuating the knife actually caused blade play to be introduced down the road, it actually is a slight bit of a detractor. Not by much, but enough to get it to a 7 out of 10 for the lock. Now, finally, we are on to the very last category. And this category is what we use 
to bring everything together, to talk about a little bit of everything, as well as the design features, and also to talk about how re how well realized was this design and how well produced was it? How good of a job did they do? There we go. We are, of course, talking about fit and finish. So fit and finish, let's talk about that for a second. It is centered. You only have to take out three screws to completely disassemble this knife. The pivot screw, the pocket clip screw, and then the screw on the other side of the pocket clip. That's it. Three screws and you're done. And by the way, did I mention they're all the same size? Shoot, let's call it four if you also want to take out the lock bar interface. That's fantastic. I've already taken this knife apart just to see how easy it was, and trust me when I say it's really easy. So if you do want to take my advice and go ahead and get some ceramic bearings for this bad boy, it's definitely not going to be too hard, and you're not going to need the whole toolkit. That's cool. Now, unlike some other knives that I've reviewed on this channel, <coughs> Beyond EDC Riverwolf, this one definitely took risks with the design cues. And you know what? We do need to talk about that. I absolutely love this extra milling here on the handle scales because it adds depth. It looks cool. It adds grip. So it's, it's not just aesthetics. It actually does add to the functionality. And, and that's great. I love it when design cues actually add to functionality. I am a little bit bummed out that there is no jimping up here because even though you can't necessarily choke up on it, I would have liked to have had at least a little bit of something. Even if it was only here next to the apex of that spine, that would have been fine. Shoot, they could have even gotten rid of this swedge altogether and made this more of a harpoon style blade and just ground this out and then boom, jimping there. But you know what? Jimping is not the most important thing. It's just a tiny little thing on my wish list. I love the addition of a titanium backspacer because it adds to the quality feel and look of this and it's also something that's going to protect the edge of that blade from crap in your pockets. If you've watched my other videos, you know I'm a sucker for backspacers. The other thing I'm a sucker for is single-sided captive pivots and this one definitely doesn't disappoint because that's exactly what it has. I hate having to screw and unscrew two different pivot screws. One is enough and it also gives us the opportunity to have something put there on the pivot. Now in this case, they left it blank, which is a shame because they did actually put some billboarding on this blade, which is not the greatest place for billboarding because if you don't notice, with it being so shiny, it collects fingerprints faster than the LAPD. Yeah, it is a Rhea design, and I think I'm saying that right, Rhea design. And on the other side of the blade, you the billboarding continues. It says TS-296 and 14C28N. I'm not mad at that billboarding. I always want to give the designers their props and their dues, but they could have moved that Two Sun logo to the pivot, and that would have looked way better. Why not? You have the space right here. Let the blade be clean. Come on. Uh, furthermore, I like the fact that this is not a traditional style blade shape. This is, in fact, what they would call a Japanese style tanto. Now, I do have another knife that has a Japanese style tanto, and it's this one, which is much more expensive. And ironically, this is also a knife that is not super, super good at following the rules. But for a comparison, there is the Arcane Plexus up against the Tucson TS-296. So yeah, and I like this knife because it takes risks, risks that are calculated and make sense. There is one thing that I do go back and forth on, and that is whether or not they should have reduced the weight by introducing some milling in the inside of these handle scales. That would have reduced the weight a lot. How much does this knife weigh? Well, in case you haven't seen my other video on this knife, which I will go ahead and link above, here's how much it weighs. So without that skeletonizing, it weighs just shy of six ounces. For a lot of people, that's really heavy. For me, I don't really care. I don't have any problem carrying around a six ounce titanium knife in my pocket. I, I It does not bother me, but to some people it will. And so for those people that would be bothered by that, I, I just wonder if they would have been better served by skeletonizing those handle skills. If they had done that, it would have jeopardized this beautiful balance that we have 
right here on this finger groove that allows me to do these you know fast flipping motions that makes hr very nervous especially when i you know do that at work while working so you know what at the end of the day it is really cool as a design and we get really good materials the ergonomics are really good as well it's fun to fidget with the lock is not the best lock in the world but it's definitely more than serviceable and so for the, all those reasons it's going to be getting an 8 out of 10 for fit and finish let's do a tiny bit of math for materials it was an 8 ergonomics was an 8 fidget factor was an 8 the lock was a 7 and fit and finish itself was an eight. You add up all of those and you get the grand total of 39. And for $80, I am very confident in that score. 39, by the way, it's not, 39 is not a grail score. This knife is not what I would consider to be a grail. It doesn't have the absolute best of anything, but it does a lot of things really well. And the things it doesn't do really well are things that are pretty decent anyways. It's a beautiful design, it's very risky, but it's also attainable for most people. If you're one of those who will not buy a knife over hundred bucks, but you still want something that feels quality and looks cool and performs well, this is it. I absolutely feel great recommending this knife and it's one that I'm very happy to have in my collection. So 39 out of 50 is a high recommend and it's near the top of the high recommend category. Let me know in the comment section down below if you agree. If you agree, great. If not, great. Give me a thumbs up. Let me know in the comment section. If you liked the video, make sure you hit subscribe. Guys, I'm Rochambeau. I'll catch you on the flip side.